Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second part of the day. I get the privilege to introduce Trent, uh, who I met. I don't even remember how long ago was it that you came down here. A while ago. A while ago. Um, yeah, I heard some guy from up north is coming down to the talk, and um, then stayed, <laughs> which is awesome. So I, I remember that talk. Actually, it was interesting. I think it was a, a neurochemical following or something. Of it was. Yeah, yeah, it was really yeah. in depth. And that's, that's it appealed awesome. to the analytical. Yeah science part of me, so I definitely connected and went on that journey of wherever you went, and it was fun. Nice. And I really, yeah, since then, we've connected, and I really actually appreciate Trent the more we get to know one another. Thanks. And I'm looking forward to uh, taking a class with you next month. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <coughs> and that's Surprise. I'm going to stop blabbing and just let you take it over. Okay, so thank, you. thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I can already see some of the students in the room crunching with my familiar with my PowerPoint style. They tend to, I tend to be kind of grandiose with what I put on. So, and I feel like Tom Cruise from Magnolia right now with this uh, mic'd up thing. Um, but I'll roll with it. So, um, a funny story real quick before I start. My mom went online and she looked at this and she called me all freaked out. And she's like, "What are you presenting?" You're going to get yourself in trouble. And she was all like in this panic and stuff about the topic. So, um, so it, was just, it was pretty funny. Did you tell her this is not the USA? Oh, yeah. I'm not an aggressive American anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> right on. So. Well, for, I mean, it seems like what I'm presenting today ties in with a lot of people or what a lot of people are presenting. And I'll be kind of going into a lot of the counseling aspect of it, like I like to do, the psychotherapeutic, although I've been warned by Gary not to get too uh, psychodynamic. So I'll steer, steer clear as much as I can of that. But um, every year I do this, I kind of sit down and contemplate, OK, what do I want to present as far as my experience kind of that year of the non-dual? And this year, it came in a very different way. Usually it like percolates around and I'm like, oh shit, am I going to make the deadline or whatever. This year it was like, boom, boom, two things really clearly. One of which was, what is the rawest, most basic, fundamental aspect of non-dual awareness? Number one. Number two, how do you communicate that foundational non-dual awareness to others in a way that's not um, reductive in a way that's not condescending in, in a way that's not too abstract and as many of the presentations have touched on today so um, what came out of that was non-dual transmission and, um, and I just put the second part because I really I, I don't like the whole uh, circuit thing like the whole it gets kind of corporate and this the messages and stuff like that so that's my own projective crap the non-dual corporate thing, you can just ignore that. But the non-dual transmission piece being that current of, um, of, uh, of electricity, it's, it's just as palpable as if you were to grab an uh, electric fence wire. Um, it's the same palpable feeling. And that basically is at the core of the, the traditions and the lineages that pass down a lot of the non-dual teachings is that direct focused blast of, 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 um, of this transmission. Now, oh, I forget, I see I have this thing, I don't even use it. This my, right here, I could just, whatever. Yeah, see my slides. I'll just, just gonna hit on the main things for the sake of time. But basically, it's known by a lot of names, this electrical current, um, the abstract, mind, Tao, God, whatever. I love Shaktipat for two reasons. Shakti is psychic energy, and pot is to draw or to bring down into the body. So it's like bringing the transcendent into the body. Boom. That meeting of the horizontal and the vertical is Shakti pot. And that's why I love the tradition of Shakti pot uh, for the spiritual current, um, because it's so demonstrative and it's so, um, you know, it, it's, it's 
money, food, sex, it's relationships, it's everything. It's, it's this spiritual current, as many of you have said today already, that's taken into the relationships. It's embodied. It, it's lived. It's taken home. Um, that's the kind of thing that I, I'm interested in. And just a few over, uh, uh, little overviews, if you will. Um, we could think of it as like a, a conventional power plant, and bear with me on this. Um, a conventional power plant, let's say a hydro dam. The water is the requisite for the energy, like the, the force of the water hits the turbines. The turbines uh, translates the energy down the wires to whatever extracts that energy. It's a monodirectional extraction model. The spiritual non-dual awareness is different, and it's different in some ways that some of you have mentioned already today. The source is already it, the source is the transmission, its own trans, transmission. The source is that which extracts it. And the one fundamental difference is when I use my toaster in the morning and I click it down, it extracts the energy it toasts. That's it. The toaster doesn't give energy back into the system. With non-dual beingness, the transmission depends on the phenomenon which, which are sustained by it. So there's participation back into the system. So it's self-sustaining. It gains its source, it gains its power, if you will, through Trent talking and doing this and being Trent. Trent is being animated and supported by this current right now. And so that's kind of what I hope to have break down, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> if I don't fall apart, <coughs> break down in, uh, in the next little bit here. So this just gives you an overview, and it's not impacted, the content does not impact this current. Um, the, the way that the sort of, the, the, the conductivity, which I'll get into here in a minute, if you think of it, of it that way, there are certain ways of being that, Im that imply much more higher levels of conductivity. And then what can happen is that the voltage of the transmission can increase with that phenomenon and the current. In the case of a guru, which I'm gonna get into, for example, that could be, that could be the case. So the, com the conductivity is higher. That doesn't change in any way the bottom line foundational current. It just, it just is a different way of, of interacting with that. And so those are just some of the things that, um, okay. I'm gonna show, thanks in a large part to, to my dear friend, Aha, uh -huh, <coughs> um, a couple of clips from uh, Swami Rudy. And I don't know if many of you know who Swami Rudy is, but you should totally familiarize yourself with him. He was a rare art uh, collector from uh, New York City in the 60s, mid 60s, early 70s. And he, I think, embodied Shaktipat and this transmission in his spiritual teaching um, about as much as anybody did. And in one of these clips, you're going to see the, the uh, physical changes in his skull, in his skull plates, because of um, when you amp up the Shaktipat to that degree, it has physiological changes in it. So I um, just want to show you a couple of these clips real quick, just because they embody, there aren't many teachers today working um, with transmission actively. Um, and if you go back to the dam metaphor for a second and you think of the turbine that turns, that turns the energy from the water into the electricity, the guru-devotee relationship would really be that turbine for, the non, for that current of being. Because without it, there wouldn't be any felt immediate experience of any kind of expanded state of consciousness as far as transcending the separate self. Um, and then you have this quote real quick before I show the, uh, the clips that I absolutely love, the Adida quote, the current of Shaktipat is only a current when we participate with it. And so that's the bottom line. Unlike regular form of like electricity, boom, you extract it. The energy of the transmission of the non-dual awareness requires participation. And I think what is what some of us have alluded to is that like, if you deny that participation or you don't take responsibility for it, it backs up. And that's where you get all kinds of crazy shit 
with gurus and cars and money and sex and like, you know, weird kind of elements happening. Um, I think that's what happens a lot because the second you grasp onto that current and you say, this is mine, I am the seven stage avatar, this is my freaking current, then boom, it just backs up and blows the psyche wide open. And I think that's what happens a lot with, with teachers. They, they're circulating it, they're circulating it, and then it's like the grab. This is part of my identity. I am the all, you know, infusive, whatever, um, avatar. And, so, and then that starts to become, okay, I'm an avatar who needs to get high every day. And then I'm an avatar who needs, you know, 50 cars to get to the airport or whatever. So you get these incredibly strange situations. And I think personally, a lot of it is this transmission current, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. If you guys need clarity or have questions, please. Uh, throw it out too. I tend to just kind of blaze ahead. So, um, but anyway, life becomes an embrace of this. Of this, and we'll get into mudras in a bit. I'm totally fascinated by mudras. Many of you know what mudras are. If you see a teacher like do it, looks like they're throwing gang signs. Um, they're not throwing gang signs. They're working the. They're working with this uh, transmission. And I have a really cool story to tell about that. So. Um, Okay, so I think that this should just, uh, okay, what do I do here? Oh, here. The idea of a teaching picture was really central to Rudy's work. He used to sit in his own store with pictures of his teachers, and you could tell that he would look at them all the time and draw energy from them. And so he made it a conscious effort to have pictures of himself taken for us, his students, to use in our own meditation. Barry Kaplan, a young student of Rudy's, was invited by Rudy to come and take these photographs. Over the course of a period of years, Barry documented Rudy, created teaching pictures for his students, and was able to create for all of us a record of Rudy's transformation as a teacher. These pictures are remarkable documents, not only of Rudy working, but also of the change in the physiognomy of his own head. We could see actual transformations of energy occurring in the skull of his head. These were not unusual manifestations, and Barry's photographs truly document some of the extraordinary changes that occur in Rudy. We were aware of Rudy as a working teacher, not someone who simply expressed ideas, but who was embodying them. His pictures, his images, are conduits to an energy that is not Rudy, but something greater than Rudy, deeper than Rudy, something infinite and eternal. Sitting with Rudy's picture. Okay. So, that, like, what did you see when you saw, like, did, did, was that like, you're like, okay, this guy's head's moving around, like, what's going on, like, um, I don't know what happened to my, what did I do? How did I do that? <laughs> I have the worst luck with this. People laugh and they know me. I have like, oh yeah, it's my transmission. Can somebody, uh, yeah, I just wanted to see the next slide. Hit your arrow to the right. Use your space, use your arrow on your Oh. Make nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this is the one right here. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, so yeah, it's like it's powerful. It's a powerful current, you know. And I know I sound like I don't want to sound like I'm I'm some. It's supernatural, but in a way, it is supernatural. It is because I mean, typically, like whether it's Advaita Vedanta or different traditions, they have this lineage of silent sitting. Of course, this this satsang. 
And that kind of stuff is what is transmitted um, from the teacher to the student. Really, the verbal stuff is really secondary to that. So it's really this voltage, um, this electricity that's blown out. Um, and we'll get into kind of the anatomy of that in a little bit. So I just wanted to show a little few ones from this one. This one may be, be a bit more controversial. We'll see. <laughs> To open to God, you have to first open to life. You have to live, you have to love, you have to enjoy and share. Because one thing builds on the other. Spirituality is based on the value that you express successfully in the physical world. And you start doing that by seeing in other people God, by opening and sharing and being responsible and serving. And if you don't have the capacity, fake it. Do until you get used to doing, you know? until you get rid of the paralysis in your heart and your hand and you begin to feel maybe six months later that the doing has given you a reward, you know? You have to do. It's very difficult, you know, for anyone to support a spiritual life unless their heart is open to themselves. And we sit down and we try to meditate, we do all of these things. But if inside we really hate ourselves, it's impossible. You have to really work and really feel your heart open in your wish to grow. You have to really right, take so a breath. I'm going to just be brief on this just so I can get through my stuff without rushing so much and stuff. But, but that's like, does, did, that, did that image bring up the whole notion of the kind of the Pentecostal preacher for anybody? <laughs> you know, like the Benny Hinn style, you know, like... A bit. Okay. <laughs> I was curious about that because in, in this context, this is transmission, whatever, but makes you wonder. Like in the other, like the, the, that tradition, the Christian tradition, a lot of the Pentecostal stuff is very driven by felt, embodied. Uh, so I don't know. It's interesting. Just curious. Um, I didn't know if anybody would be like this, you know. Like, but of course now that spells lawsuit. <laughs> that's massive. Yeah, okay, that, that's lawsuit material right there. That, I mean, that is like, that's the essence of the ashram, though, in a lot of ways, that, that transmission through, like, uh, was being said, carry uh, uh, wood, water, whatever. The daily things of life, those are put out, and you're, they're seen as a, a reflection of this, um, this electricity. So, Again, I have some slides here that just have some kind of characteristics of it. And then I was going to do kind of a, a, a little diagram just to show you a little bit. But um, so anyway, um, there are no defection points from this transmission. It is the absolute. It's all phenomenon are being sustained by this divine current. Therefore, all phenomenon are the divine current. There's no defection point from the absolute. To pretend otherwise is, I think, mental illness. <laughs> it is addiction. It is many things. Because, like was said earlier today, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, like I said earlier today, um, or like it was said earlier today, oh, now I totally lost my damn phone. Okay, anyway. Um, totally off now. It's all right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yes, defection point. Um, insisting that there is a defection point allows oneness to know itself as oneness. In order for, if you take the non-dual premise to be the case as a metaphysical premise, then there's oneness, the absolute. Well, in order for the absolute to know itself, it's got to have the relative. And that's part of my message today. It's not, you know, the occultic attachment to the relative, but allowing the relative to be what it is, so this absolute current can be seen as sustaining it. It's a different kind of approach rather than kind of going up to the absolute, the transcendent, which is great, but, but as has been pointed out, a lot of shit gets bypassed in doing that. So with this, you allow the shit to be what it is, and then 
this informs that. So there's still shit in this, but it's still moving around. So, um, and we can transform and really begin to work with this transmission as a lot of traditions and people and stuff have already pointed out. Like there are ways that are increased conductivity for this. Um, certainly being in the company of a realized uh, teacher, um, I'm old fashioned, so I think that there's value in that. And um, I think that that can be a real initiating process. It's not initiating and it's not helpful when this happens and you need that figure uh, and it becomes very edible. So, yeah. If the current itself doesn't discriminate, yes. then when you're, when you're talking about the experience of Pentecostal religion, yes. maybe it's the same current, but the understanding of what's happening that comes right. afterward, yeah. the cultural overlay, the explanation for what you experience is, I mean, it's culturally based. It could be culturally based, but it's the same current, the same experience in some way. That's true. I'm fascinated by the rattlesnake uh, uh, yeah. congregations in the Appalachian Mountains because there seems to be this correlation with working themselves up into, into kind of an altered state. Um, and then because you can't really be in your right frame of mind and reach in and grab a giant rattlesnake and uh -huh. proceed to like... So there's some sort of like altered consciousness thing with these snakes and um, yeah. That was on my mind with the Pentecostal thing, I guess. So, yeah, I think it is the same current. It's supporting all of the expressions of Christ in this case. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, so uh, where's my thing? I got all my equipment here. Um, I just put this up. Why would Trent talk about ethics? Well, for the counselors in the room, I have to go over this because it's always up for me, and I have to process it somehow or else I... Um, ethics, I'm all for ethics. Please understand me. I'm not anti-ethical. Yeah. Ethics for counseling are great. It's great we have them as a profession, psychology, especially medicine, um, things like that. But what can happen is when those ethics become part of this identity, then you get dogmatic, rigid... Um, um, unyielding ethical kind of things. And with this um, electrical current, or as Winnicott used to call it, the psychic space, like if you think between the client and the therapist, there's this space. This psychic space already has all of these things. Like it has trust, it has honesty, they're already endemic to the space itself. But then the therapist likes to come along and go, arr, arr, arr. and it really sucks for students. It's a shitty deal for students, counseling students, because what happens is you think um, there's this tendency to equate counseling skills with a grade. Obviously, I got, oh, hey, I got, a, I got an A. I must be a really good counselor. I must have really good rapport with all the people I work with. So this collapse happens into this kind of an outcome kind of piece like that. And it's lost, like the sensitivity of listening to this space in a counseling. I know it's been talked about a lot, but you can really begin to see, okay, how can we participate with what's here instead of, you know, really work like whatever to fabricate something. So um, I just put that up. So I think it's important um, to really have a good balanced sense, however it is you work with people, whether that's counseling or, yes? But you, you do what's correct to avoid doing what's right. Ooh. Well, you see, aha uh -huh, here picked up on that slippery slope real quick. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into a whole ethical thing. I mean, I'm not here to... My point in showing this is that the, there's an intelligence to the current to the, to the, of awareness, this transmission. There's, it has its own intelligence. And that intelligence will communicate. And it communicates beautifully therapeutically in all different kinds of ways. Because mental illnesses and things like that, to me, are ways to trace back kind of to source really somebody's relationship with this current. And I think that a lot of people have said that in different ways, but um, just want to touch on the shadow real quick. Gary is one of the rare ones in the non-dual world that really promulgates the shadow and really addressing it, whether that shadow is addiction, whether that shadow is some, the marginalized aspects of our psyche, that is the best conduit for this transmission. It's the best. Because what happens is, 
this light, this transmission, this electricity, it's drawn to everything. And we have, this, we have these clammed up pockets in our psyche and that electricity is still trying to get in there, which is why we get activated and we act out and all this impulse shit happens. But the second we start to really look at that and own that shadow, it opens up a little bit, bam, that electrical current is there with its intelligence. And I think a lot of the unconscious is just that. So it's this big, giant, unused conduit that we're walking around with. And that's why, you know, yeah, you go to India, you go around a teacher, boom, you're lit up. And you're like, whoa, what's happening here? And that's why. It's because what's already there is being unlocked. And so it's like, boom, a little bit of energy, a little bit of juice. Now, also what can happen, this shit gets addictive. You get into it. Where's the transmission, you know? Where's the high? You know, you look at people running around ashrams, they're junkies that way. Like, I need to be in the guru's company. I need, I need their transmission. I need, the, you know, like, they need to recreate that kind of essence. And, and it's everywhere. Like, you don't, as the Nichananda quote said that I opened with, like, it's great as an initiate thing, but you don't need it all the time. And that's where some really kind of not so healthy things can um, get involved with. When the guru becomes dad or mom, and then, yeah, it gets kind of ugly that way, so. I love this Bergson quote, I love Bergson in general, but hey, I'm really the person moving or is this object moving me? Like, again, there's this, the non-dual current, you can always tell, it has hallmark signs that, that it's kind of, like, there's a big difference between seeing with transmission and seeing with Trent. Trent's gonna look out there and Trent's gonna see John over there and I already have a narrative about John. I look at John, I, I do, I look at John over there, and I, I already have a history with him, I already have a narrative, I have all this crap that's already there. Transmission-based scene is completely different, because transmission becomes sight, sight becomes being. So I'm no longer seeing the transmission, I'm seeing is the transmission. So there's this thing about, okay, there's this, and we'll get, hope, yeah, we'll get into that here pretty soon, so... Um, Anyway, my point is, another reason to welcome in the shadow, because it's a great conduit, and it's going to draw that to it, especially if you're with a teacher. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> like somebody said, like that point of excruciating purification, where the sadhana, where your stuff bubbles up to the top and boils over, and that's, that's that point where you can really begin to kind of work with that, or in any day capacity, really, so. All right, so, um, so this current, real quick, I hope everyone can see, this is just a rudimentary thing. I'm not an electrician or whatever, but I'm going back to my basic uh, diagram metaphors. Uh, as uh, was pointed out, metaphors seem to be the thing of the day, so. You can think of the transmission this way, and this is just for a frame of reference. Um, you think of those giant cables that hold up, uh, uh, chair lifts, gondolas, they look like these big fatty cables they are. Within those big fatty cables, there are, um, there are a lot of other, <clears throat> excuse me, smaller cables, you know. And then you typically get a couple bigger ones, and then there's like all these smaller ones. I've seen them split in half. And in many ways, the non-dual, <clears throat> if you think of a current going through the cable, <clears throat> it looks like this. The two main ones being this, being the bhakti, the bhakti current or the heart, and this being the jain or the head. And this is a gross oversimplification. But um, Adi Da used to tell us this, that like it, our body had like these apertures. Think of them as openings. They're like portals that we naturally have that connect and that, are, that receive this non-dual electricity, this current. He said most of them all the time are typically out of business. They're shut down or they require a drug or something else to get them remotely open. Now, and so the bhakti and the jain, the bhakti is uh, slightly right to the heart and you can physically feel the transmission, that's where the transmission is received there. Then you have the jain, the kind of the more analytical centered, and then you have the vital, the chakras down here, the sex, tantric stuff which is equally as valid. All over us we have these apertures. And so, and then you, in here you may have like emotions and the different perceptions and like and these are all interacting to affect the architecture 
Uh, because again, how can oneness know oneness? Only through the appearance of two. And so even the meanderings of the two and the whole, you know, like the prodigal son and all that, that's complements of this. And so really therapeutically for counseling and psychotherapy, you can really begin to help somebody plug into this. Now, this doesn't necessarily imply like a 12-step method, or it doesn't necessarily imply like a religious connotations. It can be anything. If your deal is athletics and you just get in that zone when you're doing something, uh, running or whatever, then that, is a, then that is a sensitivity point that you have to this uh, non-dual current. That is a point where you're making contact. If you're an artist, you know, if you, um, you know, whatever it is you're into, like the passions, the things that take you a little bit further, th those can be sensitivity points um, that you had. And I was going to read, uh, 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 I didn't bring the book. Wow, okay. Let that one go. Um, uh, anyway, Trungpa has this thing with crazy wisdom and gurus, and he talks about it this way. You can get somebody to lead you closer to this voltage, to this energy, but it's going to freaking, it's going to burn you. And it's, it's the, the, the intelligence of the current is not, as many of you pointed out, to make your life in the munchkin land. Um, it's to really remove any sense of separation from you and to remove your completely ridiculous notion that you can somehow stand outside of this current, that you're not sustained by it every moment, that every breath you take isn't predicated on Shakti Pot. Um, and that's kind of the, the quote he gets into. So the guru can destroy you. The guru can do all kinds of fun things with you. Um, depending on what's going on with this, with this current. Um, so, okay, anyway, all right, flowing along, cool. All right, um, this is, I'm just going to, on a few of these, just kind of, um, you don't need, a, like, to pay a con ed bill to get hooked up to the Shakti pot, or you don't need, like, breath is great, because um, uh, Adi Da used to look, he used to say it this way, this current has these pulsations on it like this, like any, like any energy current does. And those are the kind of the, the, the highs and the lows, the ebbs and the flows. Those are needed as part of the architecture of consciousness to create Trent thinking that he's not uh, uh, in this current all the time as oneness. So our emotional patterns mirror this. So a lot of the shit that's brought up about emotions, and I love that whoever, there was, there was a couple digs in emotion today, I was in. I, lo I love emotion. I'm a very emotional, heartfelt person. But a lot of times what happens is it's easy to attribute that emotion again to your narrative of your separate self. So if you see it more as the pulsation of, of the one living you, and I, to me, like, that's my sort of reference to mental health. Oh, I think I have it up here in a slide. It says it better. But anyway, so there's these currents in it and those kind of... Um, it can be helpful therapeutically to. Um, oh, sorry. It can be uh, helpful therapeutically to um, help somebody drop their issues, if you will, into some model like this, into the notion of. <coughs> excuse me. Aldous Huxley used to call it the divine ground of being. Whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, so, uh, or a current, or, or whatever. So I like the current because it's in flux and it moves. So, um, yeah, so this is, I'm just going to go through quickly a few of these so I can get to some meat and potatoes here. Um, since nothing is not supported by the current, everything is the current. I've already went through that one, so, okay. Um, this one here, the degree of mental illness and addiction is in direct proportion to the degree one believes one is living to the immediacy of knowing one is being lived. What do I mean by being lived? That's very abstract, but it's not. It's a palpable, tangible difference to really, with, with, that, with that sense of awareness, you participate in the conductivity, which increases the conductivity, which increases the awareness. So it starts begetting its own sort of refining. And again, the process is not to make this a method or a technique, because again, you're just allowing the intelligence of this to speak, whether that's going for a quiet walk in the morning or whatever you want to do. Just like shut your, shut your, you know, your hole for a bit and like allow the intelligence 
to speak to you. That's a big part of it. So it's very tangible. And I love this piece with identity and mental illness because there is, there's a direct link. Of course, the flexibility of the self, uh, the uh, adaptability, the openness of the self to all of these things. Um, and again, but again, those are part of finding out where a person is sensitive to this current. Is it here? You know, like I've worked with some like typically medical doctors aren't real like here oriented. I mean, there are some, but you have to engage them naturally wherever they're at and then work with the electricity, the electrical current that way. For some people, it's not an electrical current. They have a different visualization of it. Visual, that's great. You know, again, I'm not here to, you know, propriety or something with it, you know, it's just ways of looking at it, so. Um, oh yeah, so therapy as transmission. This is a hard one for me. I wish I hadn't put this there because I don't want to. I don't want to evoke the image. I don't want to evoke the image of like, okay, okay, okay. Here's the deal. Here, here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna psychodrama just a little bit here with this here. I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna sit down here. I'm a, I'm a therapist. Like if I sit like that with a client there, what what are they gonna do? What is that gonna do? Like they're gonna, yeah, like they're, yeah, they're gonna get up and leave and probably you know wonder. You know, so the transmission is great, but you can't just sit there and like beingness, all that stuff is great, but like how does it translate um, into like, you know, and as I've said over the past couple of these, these things, like how do you take someone's depression and, and apply, like, make it meaningful with respect to the non-dual? How do you do that? Well, it's already meaningful. It's already meaningful, again, that you can trace it back to this as, a, as, as the relative, then this quote says, letting the relative be as it is, then reveals the absolute. So you can let depression be as it is, trace that root back to this source, to that relationship with this, um, with this, electrical, with this electrical. I mean, that's the, that's the metaphor I'm rolling with because it came up for me this year, but uh, water, fluidity, maybe a little bit better, um, but it's all good. My point is, we are being sustained every moment, literally. And like Aida used to say, a lot of his satsogs and stuff were geared towards luxurating, like really enjoying, letting just, ah, letting go, enjoying being sustained, enjoying being lived, enjoying being infilled. Like practice that, it takes practice because we're all so yeah, fucking wretched this all the time so you got to really like practice from this to this and and this takes some practices ironically um, so the this dimmer switch there's a lot of these little dimmer switches within our receptive points um, again not turning like emotions not necessarily turning them back on somebody but having them say hey you know how do you think this relates to this greater you know, it may sound kooky, but people can relate to this somehow. The, I'm not, and again, it can be a perfect atheist. I don't care. Transcendence is transcendence. It doesn't imply any kind of belief system. Um, but the immediacy of that is always available. It's always accessible. And I think that's what the teacher does, is it brings you that immediacy. And then you get addicted to it and try to replicate it. And yeah, it goes. OK, so, oh, geez, what was that? <laughs> All right. Um, oh yeah, this is a quote I want, just want to share for you about feeling. The problem is not the feelings or the emotions. The problem is our refusal to feel into it fully. And I know I'm bombarding you with a lot of Aida quotes, but that's just where I'm at this year. So again, you don't feel fully. You limit your feeling. And then you say, ah, oh, it's that fucking feeling or whatever. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. That's not the problem. The problem is you're limiting yourself from that feeling. And then, and then you're pinching yourself, as he used to say. And then you're blaming somebody else for the pain and the fact that you're, that you're pinching yourself. Um, so, again, the transmission of emotion without the reaction goes directly into beingness. And beingness then becomes this transmission. So... When transmission becomes beingness, it, it's self-authenticating. This, this current is self-authenticating. It doesn't need any 
And that's why a lot of the teachings are very minimalist and they don't put a lot of insular crap around it. It's because it's self-evident. So as he's saying here, you know, you're always, if feeling becomes limitless, if you do not contract, then feeling becomes being. And to me, that's like the bottom line. If I could take one thing today and like, you know, go out, you know, advocate for it, that would be it. Because again, the emotions get really m messed up and they get these narratives with them. And this is kind of a case of like, feel into it fully, that then opens up into this divine transcendent ground. And then that ends, and then that just supports itself. And that's the beautiful thing about the non-dual tradition, it supports itself. It doesn't need a bunch of props and crap. And I love that, which is why I have a bunch of props and crap, so. <laughs> all right, that's the irony. Um, all right, so this one I'm gonna skip over. Um, uh, yeah, the regulation control thing. Um, all right. Okay. All right, so here, the therapeutic piece. If you think about this, because I like to go back to the counseling piece, a lot of homework is geared towards supporting the first person predicate, the narrative of the separate self. You go home, you do this, and write about, journal this, and that's great, but I guess for more of this kind of thing, this point of view, you would, you would work more with mediums like imagination, Carl Jung's medium of imagination from the psyche. He felt that that was the ground in the psyche. You might use Winnicott's notion of play. You might use relaxation with clients. I think that a lot of times is more effective, like learning how to relax, learning how to be open, not adding another technique on it. And so that, in turn, increases conductivity. The intelligence infuses you, and that is self-authenticating. So that's kind of how that works. Um, the, the, the homework then from counseling therapy can really be geared towards helping a client become sensitive to this in their daily life. When are the points of their day when they kind of go, oh, that was weird, or that doesn't look normal? Because those are the points, typically, where this <coughs> awareness is trying to you know, get in a little bit. So you can really begin, and I know Jason does this a lot, using um, different, you know, you really meld the therapeutic with self-awareness. And actually the program here, um, the Addictions Counseling Program, that's really um, what it does as well. So, um, okay, how much time have I got? Okay, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm just gonna, see I never do an, uh, um, right there. Okay, so I will get into this <coughs> real quick. <coughs> I worked with, this lady, I'm just going to mention something about it real quick. Very analytical, very bright, had a history of religious abuse, uh, eating disorder, and uh, sexual abuse as well, so kind of all three. Um, very sensitive to this metaphor of the non-dual current. Um, very, very sensitive. Um, and so really, you know, like again, taking her, her notions, her narrative around each of those and kind of dropping it into this non-dual current. And in the counseling space, we actually did kind of some representations of that whole notion to kind of uh, support that intelligence. Um, but the dark emotions piece was really where I began to see kind of with myself. It wasn't my own, like, okay, I'm going to deal with my dark emotions. I really saw through her, the conduit that those became for her, and they fueled her sort of uh, intelligence and her awareness. And so that... Um, kind of was, was an impetus for myself as well. Um, Adi Da used to use an, an, an analogy of a tuning fork. If one side vibrates, the other little fork vibrates naturally to the same one. But the second one goes like this and grasps onto it and goes, why isn't it vibrating like this anymore? I'm not like this anymore. And so there's all these metaphors that you can do. Because again, it's all oneness um, or the absolute, only one subject. Um, and it would reconfigure everything. Because we'd begin to, and again, not see a room full of how many people, we'd begin to see expressions of this non-dual beingness in all of you. And so it kind of reconfigures um, how, how you do that. It reconfigures, um, I just want to go over this real quick. I know it looks, oh boy, okay. Well, I got a few minutes, don't I, because we started late. Um, therapeutic rapport. We all know this as counselors, therapists, people who work in this capacity in any kind of human services. 
you have this emotional connection with people. You know, I'm a good counselor. Oh, I have good rapport. I establish trust with this person. <laughs> what Jacob Moreno, which I think is, I, there are the three psychotherapist psychology people that I could see really being plugged in to the world of non-dual models are Jacob Moreno, Alexander Lowen, and uh, uh, Wilhelm Reich for energetic reasons. But um, the founder of psychodrama took the notion of tele. And tele in Latin means difference. Now, why in the hell would you take a notion of therapeutic rapport, connection with somebody, and build it on a model of difference? Because he said one important, a couple of really important things. You've got to accept the relative difference of the client and the therapist first. And then you can subsume that, let that go into the connection that's always there. He felt that Telly was non-egoic. He felt that Telly stemmed from consciousness itself. It was impersonally how consciousness, again, if it's going to have rapport with itself, then it's got to have the appearance of two-ness to have rapport. So again, these are ways you can kind of uh, unpack and let, um, let it go back into, into this kind of thing. Anyway, his point was this. He called it telic sensitivity. We have all through down these different apertures, radar. You know, you think of the Malaysian area, you see all these images of radar going out. Well, we have radar being sent out, and it's looking constantly for uh, things like empathy, connection, uh, or the lack thereof. But, but most importantly, it's looking for this, this energy, this electricity. And he basically said that, again, it's self-authenticating. Boom, it goes out, boom, it comes back, and one informs the other, and then rapport happens, if you will. So there's all these kinds of, again, receptive points for this awareness within counseling or whatever that looks like for um, however, however you guys are working with people. So, um, and again, we like to think that we have the, the great rapport. And this is the trickiest one for students because it's the only measurable thing you have with rapport is a grade. Like really, when it comes down to it, it's viewed as a, as a, as a micro skill of counseling. So if John comes in for counseling, I'm going to be looking for things to, to validate my connection with John. And I'm working on a paper right now about this, this, this notion of proximity. So in order for rapport to be present, there needs to be some good shit there. I need to have a smile from my client. I need to have a nod. I need to have them leaning forward. When those things aren't there, then what happens to the rapport? So with this kind of a model, you kind of step out of that because the rapport is there as a fundamental ground of being supporting that. So it's really not about you. <clears throat> There's more of an impersonal. And you can collaborate with a client. You know, hey, there, you know, there, there seems to be some trust here. What does that look like, you know? And, and then kind of avoid the narcissistic aspect of building rapport. All right, so I'm going to end on this um, one little story. Um, that I have for you. And it was um, a July afternoon. It was, I swear to God, about 104 degrees. And it was at the Northern uh, Mountain of Attention Sanctuary in Northern California. And I was there on retreat, and I was building a feedlot for the camels. There's a zoo on the, on the ashram. It's called the Fear No More Zoo. It's, it's my favorite part of the entire. Um, anyway, animals have a spiritual practice. They can Anyway, so I'm there at the zoo, I'm building this feedlot, and I hear the, the, uh, the famous Darshan scream, Darshan! <laughs> so I come run into the meditation hall and my tool belt, whatever, in the back, and so I sit down and I proceed to have the most Shakti pot laden two hours of my entire life. Um, and I don't mean, to, I, I, I want to preface this. I'm not saying this like a war story, like, oh, look at me, I came, I was transformed, you know. It, it happened and it was pretty eye-opening as far as this transmission goes. And basically what happened was I came in the Darshan uh, tent thing and, and my body started immediately kind of doing these things with my, my spine and my head would go up and my eyes would close and yet I could still see what he was doing. And he was up there doing these, these things, and he would go like this, and then he would pick his foot up, and he would go like this. 
every time he did one with one foot, he would shape shift to a male form. And when he would do one with another, he would shape shift back to a female form. Other times he would do kind of weird and it was both and it would blend out. And this happened and it was just like, whoa, whoa. And of course, I immediately wanted to make it mine, as did everyone else in the room, because a lot of people had that experience. And he wrote some communication and he basically said that the images had nothing to do with him. That it was the amplage, the voltage in the room getting to such a certain point that these appeared spontaneously. And he said that they were the product, the manifestation of this current. And that really all he was doing in his was just kind of like a piano. You play, you get, you regulate, manipulate a little bit the energy. So that kind of opened my eyes a little bit to that. And, um, and it was good because it kind of quelled the, our desire to make it special and neat and about us and, and everything else. But that, and he used to say that many times, like the, antici the, the amplitude, the in uh, intensity of the energy is always underlying every moment. But our separate self doles the conductivity to the point in any moment that we have no connection with that fact. When in fact, what was going on in that, in that meditation tent was the reality in every moment and is supporting it, then you know, it's a pretty good deadening act on my part on a moment to moment basis to draw that conductivity down. So in other words, it's not something special. You don't have to go like, it is, it's, it's accessible every moment. It's just really participating with it and getting to know it a little bit, allowing it to communicate to you because it's different for everybody. You know, you may be a real sensual person. It may appear that way, tactfully. You may appear in many different ways, but to just like stop and at least acknowledge that. And that increases the conductivity. And so it's this self, it's this non-dual kind of uh, give and take throughout the day that we have a process to kind of participate with in and exchange some energy with. So thank you. That's all I have. I don't stop now.